First, let me just say thank you to all of you wonderful, stellar, successful women for being here. We are so excited to have you and so grateful to have you. This is the first of many workshops and roundtables with women that just have reached a certain level in their career and have so much education and information and guidance for so many other women who are just not where they want to be in their career and need advice and counsel and mentoring. Do you want to start with the first question, my I'd friend? I'd love to. Great, dig in. All right, so the first thing we're going to speak about is finding your voice. And there's been a lot published recently and a lot in the media about um, challenges for women to speak up and be heard as often as their male counterparts. So the question to you is, did you experience this? Um, how have you overcome it? And what advice do you have for women in their career who, who may see this as a challenge? And of course, if this wasn't the challenge for you, uh, maybe how did you help other women find their voice? I think there are two questions in the question that you just posed. One is the challenge in speaking up. Yes. One is the challenge in being heard. And I think that those two things are obviously related, but I think that they are different. Uh, probably to my own peril, I didn't have any problem speaking up when I was younger. I look back now and I wish I had not spoken up as much as I did. Um, but, but where I was successful in speaking up, I think it had to do with being fact-based. It always had to do with doing my homework. When I was young and, and earlier on in my career, if I knew the numbers, if I had the date, if I had the story, the company name, the person's name, whatever it was that lended itself to my being credible, uh, that was a huge advantage to me. I think that wears off over time. I think that as you get later into your career, you've got to be able to get to the point and speak to the language of, uh, in the language of business and make sure that you are talking not just as a communicator but as a business person around the table. But that speaking up you know, has got its own set of fears and being heard, I think, sometimes is a separate issue. I also didn't have a problem with it. I think because I was a musical theater kid in high school, who knows, or um, I actually did, I sort of grew up in companies that were largely women run, also in the beauty sector, like, like Maureen can attest to, lots of women in communications. So I always felt that I was in a safe space you know, forgive the, the, the expression. Um, but w when I did start to be in environments where there were more men, I remember getting to Edelman um, six Oof. years ago, and like, oh, whoa, shocking. It's quite a few men here. <laughs> I didn't work with these many men at DeVries um, or at L'Oreal. And I think for me, it then became the speaking up had to be even more, I think Kim's absolutely right, insight-based, fact-based to break through, mm -hmm. to be heard in the room. But also, I tended to react a lot when I spoke up as opposed to responding thoughtfully. So when I talk to young women now, well, not just young women, anyone who's trying to learn how to communicate more effectively in a business environment, no matter what gender is sitting around the table, the ability to listen actively and thoughtfully, um, formulate a response before just reacting so that you can get in, you know, especially in a big room of people. Um, and, and boy, oh boy, I'm still working on that. I think the tendency to just react so you can get your voice out there no matter what actually can, can undermine you. Just building on what you're saying, it used to be where I would try to push to say something just to say something on the agency side. Um, it could be a little bit because you were on the client service side and you want to make sure that your client knew that you were interested in what they were saying or whatever, but on this side, I just, I don't talk for the most part. I listen and I'm a fly on the wall. And I ask to be included in as many meetings as I can, but nine out of 10 times I don't say anything. I just want to absorb. But when I do say something, I'm listened to. And I think that's something to think about is, is active listening and also just being more strategic in when you talk. If I could add a, a, a practical side to that as well, I think the substantive points that have raised are important. But I, early in my career, I was Early, you know, just starting out, and I worked with a big Texan who had a personality to go with it, who was instrumental in my career and, and had taught me has, has taught me a lot of lessons. But any time I paused for a bit of air, he'd jump in, and I need. You know, there was one day we were having a back and forth, and I and I put my hand up to just signal I'm not done talking yet, and I saw his eyes look at my hand, and he stopped himself because he didn't even realize what he was doing most of the time. So I think that there's also some practical, tactical elements mm -hmm. to uh, signaling that you're ready to command the floor or you're not yet done speaking. 
that are helpful for women to think about. We all know that hashtag MeToo was very important. We needed it and it, a lot of change and a lot of good change came out of it. But when I started hearing about it, and I'm sure I have a feeling every one of you felt this way, what's going to happen with men and women in the workplace? And there's been a lot of reports, um, the Lean In organization, Sheryl Sandberg's uh, organization has a lot of statistics that are supporting the fact now that men are very concerned, not only at the senior level, but at the junior level as well. They don't want to go, they're not inviting senior women to go on trips, not yet, nor, nor junior women. They're not inviting them to big conferences. They're even excluding them at client dinners, again, because of drinking and the, and the fear that something could happen and the fear that something could happen with one of the women that works for them with a client. And if that situation arises, they know that they either have to eliminate the woman from the company or they have to get rid of the client. So it's a very slippery slope right now. And I just wondered if any of you, because you're mostly all in male and female um, directed companies, if you're feeling this, it's an unconscious bias. I don't know where it's all gonna end, but I'm curious if you are hearing it, seeing it, feeling it in your, in your work environments. I'd like to jump in on the Me Too question. Um, like all the questions that we deal with in our work, it, it provokes us to really have to think deeply yes. about right and wrong, good and evil. And I, I feel passionately that the Me Too moment was long overdue, that it needed to happen, that things had existed in the workplace that were unfair and discriminatory and painful. I also believe in due process, and I think that men and people who are accused generally are also entitled to be heard and have a chance to be fairly judged. The second part of your question is really about how to cope with it in the workplace. And I think about that both as an executive and also as a client. And so as a client, whenever someone comes in to pitch me anything, I always ask, well, are there women on the team? Are there people of color on the team? Because you know, you're received by a group of guys who haven't considered um, that you as a client have a great power, an enormous authority to be able to ask for slates of diverse uh, trusted partners. For myself, um, I, I think that it's important to, be, to refuse to be excluded. I learned to play golf just so I wouldn't be left behind when they all went out to play golf. And whether it's golf or a dinner or an outing, I think it's really important to present yourself at the door with your suitcase packed with the expectation that you're going. And don't necessarily wait for an invitation or someone to hold the door for you to walk through, but to present yourself as ready, willing, able, and expecting to be included. It then has a secondary responsibility to make sure that your people, your colleagues, the women in your division, that it holds true for them. So if you see a team forming around something, you say, well, what about Joanna? What about Jennifer? Mm -hmm. um, it's a great point that you, that you make. And I feel like people in those positions have a responsibility to take that forward. So when Me Too first came out, I sort of didn't know what to make of it. And I maybe came to some of the same conclusions that you're seeing in this data of maybe this will have a chilling effect. Maybe this will hurt me in some way. But as time has gone on, I've just come to see how this movement has just seeped into the ether and in a way has redrawn the lines in terms of what's okay and what's not okay. And as uh, a person still coming up in her career, it's just been incredibly empowering. And I feel that it has been slow, but now maybe going back to our last question about you know the difficulties in speaking up, I feel that not only do I have to speak up, it's my duty to speak up because now is the time the door has been opened, and if we don't walk through that door, it will close again. Oh, good for you. Yes. And that, I hope that that sense of self-empowerment is something that you really drive at Mark to the women that work for you and the women below you and above you. I just also want to add um, that 
we have choices as to where we work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to choose to work in the places where your voice can be heard mm -hmm. and where the door is going to be open and to not work in the places where it doesn't. And seeing it from some leaders, just to finish that thought, who take something like the Me Too movement, which could be seen as divisive between men and women, mm -hmm. But I think one thing that leaders can do well is to flip that and say, really, we have to focus on what brings us together. And our culture should be all about these values of inclusiveness and diversity and justice and freedom. And that's actually what brings us together rather than divide us. I, I also just wanted to talk about the, the confidence gap. There's a lot of talk about women who show that they're empowered and they have a lot of confidence are not respected many times in business, although men who show that they are extremely confident and even overconfident seem to be the heroes, and women get punished for it sometimes. And, and to add to what you're saying, you know, in, in my career often the, um, the bad word was ambition. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard this, but oh, you're, you're ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and that was never a positive term when someone used it. Uh, and, and yet it is a trait that we need in our companies to be ambitious and to set goals and, and to go further. Um, and and the, other, the other thing that you all probably heard as well is people are intimidated. And, and, and it's brought to you as though, you know, it's your fault. You know, people are intimidated, you need to fix it. I would put that element in as well because I'm sure those are things that, that we've heard and that people who are trying to be ambitious and advance their careers are hearing. What advice can we give and how, how did you address it in your career and, and what could someone do to feel a little more confident in expecting that and knowing how to, to respond in a gracious way? Yeah, where's the balance? You know, where is it okay, but you can't go beyond that or you're determined to be too ambitious? Too ambitious. Oh. The, the question and the, uh, the comments you're raising about ambition and confidence, it's multifactorial in yes. how it plays out yes. in the workplace. And we've all sat around the table where maybe someone's being considered for a promotion, and often with a guy, they'll say, oh, I know he can do it. I just know he can do it. I can feel it. And there might be a woman who's done it three times in four different ways, yes. and they're just not sure. Yes. She's kind of got what it takes. Absolutely. So obviously speaking up on behalf of someone else in mm -hmm. those circumstances is very important that you're advocating for um, a female colleague as opposed to ad advocating for yourself. But I think the ultimate um, move here, and I know many people around this table have made bold moves in their careers, is the willingness to leave. And if, mm -hmm. if women just say, you know, I, I should have gotten that job, or I deserve this, or I'm underpaid, but you sit there and continue to exist in that environment, it's uh, demeaning and it, it, it provides others the opportunity to demean you. And if you think that you're not being fully appreciated or the opportunities don't exist for you, I say make the move mm -hmm. and try another place. You get the benefit of learning because you're in a new sector or the onboarding into a new company. Mm -hmm. Because I think that men have been willing to do that over time. And I would encourage women to do the same. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, that's usually not in the dialogue. So it's, it's not working for you, so leave. Mm -hmm. You don't see that in the books. It's all the things that you have to do to be successful. But if it's not working, you gotta leave. Exactly, how simple is that? That's the title of your book, You Gotta Leave. <laughs> I'm writing a lot of books. But, um, I worked at American Express for three years, and then I left to go work for President Clinton. And sure enough, American Express called me back a year and a half later to run their corporate affairs in Europe based out of London. I don't think they would have considered me for that position if I had just stayed in house with yes. them for those years. Yeah. At big companies in particular, I think it's easy enough to change policy. What's difficult is changing behavior across yes. the board. Uh, and it's often the case that data rooms run, uh, rule supreme at big companies. So some of, some of the practices that we've tried to implement to combat this exact problem is having a third party from our talent organization sit in and listen to reviews and talent assessments um, to say, oh, are we only using that term sharp elbows for women? Because mm -hmm. it would seem yes. in this many interviews or this many talent discussions that's been the case. Wow. And presenting back the data and the facts 
to the men who are embracing these views without often realizing it and making them more aware of what they're doing. So I, I think that there are some exercises and some practices that we can start to put in place that bring awareness to the behavior and help drive change. I come from an interesting background because I was on the media side, on the agency side, and so I was solely based on generating results. Mm -hmm. So my whole career was virtually continuing to push my successes. Your KPIs. Exactly. And so, you know, it was one of those things that I didn't really know anything different. And so when I started grooming teams, I said, you need to show what you're doing. Anytime you want to tell me, look what I did. I know it sounds so elementary, but it's not. And so when I moved over to in-house and I worked mostly with men, I started doing the same thing. And I did it in a strategic way, but the way in which I would, you know, in some sense, holistically package up and merchandise what my team has done, I still do that. Mm -hmm. And I find value in that because, you know, especially when you work for a big organization, if you don't fight for yourself, mm -hmm. no one is going to fight for you. So mm -hmm. if you aren't the one to put that paper on the table to show mm -hmm. what your team has done, it's never going to be there. So it's so important. It's bold, and you have to be bold. I think there's this. Um, there's this added layer of, of this conversation, which is sort of about you know demographic cohorts. Because I think if you layer in, forgive me, because I'm about to talk about your dem your cohort, um, Taylor. But I would like to strike from the record the word entitled in connection to millennial employees. Because first of all, millennials are turning 40 soon, so let's get over the fact that they're all like teenagers, right. wandering around you know the workplace in glitter makeup. Like it's absurd. Um, that's Gen Z, and we've got those too, but that's another panel discussion. But I really work very hard with my younger employees to, to strike entitled out of my own brain, because if somebody comes to me confidently, as you're talking about, Taylor, with concrete results that they produced, that's not entitled. You know, that's, I did this. There's not even editorializing there. I accomplished these results. I think that's why I'm ready for my next opportunity, or whatever. And I think there's, you know, your reaction came to like, oh, God, like, it is so the world needs fixing. There is so much editorializing. Mm -hmm. Sharp elbows, the metaphors that are used. Mm -hmm. You know, if we just, if whether we're reviewing our own employees or advocating for ourselves, if we stick to behaviors and facts, I think it's harder and harder to create confidence as a pejorative. I was six months into my, my relatively new role as Scholastic, and I felt it was time for me to give a progress report to my CEO and my chief strategy officer of what I had accomplished since I had been there because they hired me to be a change maker. So there was no question about that being sort of too aggressive or, well, look at her promoting herself. I was like, they want to know what I've done. Absolutely. It's my responsibility to tell them. Mm -hmm. And I told them, you know, and I just stated the facts. So I think there's part of this is the, the, the performance review process, how we train people to give feedback, um, which is kind of broken, um, I think, in a lot of companies and distinguishing behaviors, as you said, from the editorializing around the behavior, which is where some of these images persist. I think also sometimes it's the most simplistic things. You see men walk up to other men and say, I did this. <laughs> and I'm like, OK. And then he goes, good job. And then the person walks away. So sometimes I'll walk up. I mean, again, you want to have strategy in what you're doing. But, but you know, there's a lot of you know, research, too, about men that just you know, kind of start to um, promote the work that they're doing when that's part of their day job, right? So it's kind of, I, I did the thing that you asked me to do. Thank you so much. Okay, go get a cookie. Like, you know, so, so it's, but, it, but it's kind of looking at some of, of that behavior to say, maybe we take it too seriously. Maybe we don't have to have a formal presentation. At times, it sounds like we do. If it's a review, if you're coming in in a new company and you want to sit down with pen and paper, but sometimes it's just having those conversations where if you see the CEO, if you're, I mean, for me, my CEO, um, he travels a lot. So when he's in town and I have an opportunity to catch up, I tell him a little bit about what's been going on, you know, and it doesn't have to be something, you know, so formal, but he gets it and he learns in a few minutes that team, her team, they're doing stuff. And men like to know what are they doing? What are they accomplishing? Are they sitting around? Or are they actually generating results? And so if you can do that in a perfect, you know, in a more of a formal setting or even in a casual setting, I think you get your point across. The same I, way. I think it's important to balance I versus we because I think a lot of women have been told mm -hmm. that it's not attractive to say I yes. and that I is a dirty word. Yes. And so it's always we. And, and when a compliment is paid to us, we say, oh, it wasn't me. It was the team. Mm -hmm. And I'm not suggesting I that we that should not give credit where credit is due. But I don't think I is a dirty word. I think there's, there's 
a role for I and there is a role for we, and I think they both need to be in our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Something that I kind of reject from the achievement accomplishment standpoint, it's the, what I think of as sort of the, the pink washing of female success. I think it was Gail Hyman recently who said, you know, someday I want to be known for being in that pantheon of leaders, not for being in the pantheon of female yes. leaders. And I think that we have to sort of fight to, to make sure that we are competing, you know, sort of in a unisex playing field, not mm -hmm. just in the girls club and rising mm -hmm. to the top. I think that's really important and you hear that more and more. I don't want to be recognized as being a, a powerful woman. I want to be recognized as being powerful and successful in the, in the, in the entire sphere of It's Venus Williams, I, right? I exactly. don't want to be an amazing female exactly. athlete. I exactly. want to be an amazing athlete. Th there's yep. another side mm -hmm. to that, though, which I've worked with a lot of senior women who have shied away from that and not spoken out on women's issues because of that very issue. Mm -hmm. However, there is a need and an appetite for women to see other women succeed and to have it's those true. women celebrated. It's it. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a balance. Mm -hmm. To your point about the, the confidence uh, and, and how that's received, it's not only men who expect women to be nice, it's women who expect women to be nice. Mm -hmm. be so, nice. exactly. So I, I think we all have to take, uh, and analyze our own behaviors and our own reactions and make sure that we're not part of the problem as well. And if, if you're at all reluctant to do it for yourself, let's do it for the people who work for us. Because our teams are watching us and if we're not right. saying, you know, wow. Taylor did a great job on this, then they, I think they will feel very un, underrepresented. Mm -hmm. Next we're going to talk about being a lone wolf. We know that here in 2019, out of the Fortune 500, there's only 25 female CEOs, so that's about 6%. Um, we know there is a lack of, we've talked about it already tonight, you, you've said you're the only female in many of the meetings you go to. Uh, we all know what it's like to be the only woman in the room, maybe the only person under 50 in the room, maybe the only American in the room, and you can keep adding on and adding on your characteristics. But many of us have had that experience where we are the only one representing our views. That's a different experience than our male counterparts have mm -hmm. in many cases. So the question is, is two parts. How have you navigated this in your career? And what have you done to change it? And what can you advise people who are experiencing this for the first time. There's, a, there's an educator that um, we've worked with at Scholastic. He's come in and done some talks. He's very, very focused on equity in education and particularly literacy. And I love listening to him because I take life lessons from him that apply all over the place. This educator I'm talking about gave me the distinction I had never thought about before because we think about uh, allies a lot, right? How often do we talk about the need to be an ally in corporate America? Or frankly, just to be an ally so that you can use your platform of power and privilege to help elevate or give voice to people who don't have it. And the distinction was not just an ally, but an accomplice. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that you can't just, being an ally is stating that I stand with you, whether you're the lone wolf woman or you're the person of color at the table. But if you're an accomplice, you're gonna like do for that person. So where I'm now focused more is how can I either be an ally or an accomplice or help find other accomplices within the organization to help protect, but, but in a way that lifts up and empowers, not sort of coddling mm -hmm. um, people who are marginalized for whatever reason, whether it's gender, sexual orientation, um, race, whatever. But I love that distinction. This happens so often in, in the workplace kind of domestic responsibilities, things that get in the way. You have a child, you have a parent who is sick. You have to go home because your husband isn't well. Pew Research and Harvard did a study and what came out of the study is that women who take, who decide that they want to have children and they decide to take three or four days off and work from home, there is such a bias against them. What, what is happening according to the research is that they do not get the promotions, they don't get the same amount of money, they're not thought of as great new business people because they're not present. And I think this is for women that really want to get into the C-suite, that they have to understand that there is this bias and there, there is this, this, this the whole um, attitude about flex time is not always 
complimentary if you want to be that woman that is mm -hmm. the CEO. For those moms that want to work hard and make money and, and work from home three days a week, it's absolutely fine for them. They're happy and they make their money and everybody's happy. It's a win-win. But the research says for those women that want to be in the C-suite, as women, we have to know. We have to know what the data says and what it's showing. And it really, it surprised me. And we've been grappling with flexibility for years, as is, I think, every every company. Yes. Um, so I just wondered how, because Taylor, you, you brought it up, how you guys are handling this in the, in the workplace. So I'll say something that might be a bit prov provocative to that, which I, I don't think it's just bias. I think that there are real impacts to working from home three days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of how I'm able to do my job is based on the relationships that I have internally, understanding yes. where people stand on yes. specific issues, mm -hmm. being able to walk down the hall and have an informal conversation. And those things come from being present. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there is a cost to be paid. Yes. Um, there, there are biases in the system for sure, but I think that there are real consequences as well. And, and trade-offs. Um, yes. You know, these are uh, mature trade-offs that people can make. If you prefer a more flexible schedule and you're prioritizing mm -hmm. your home life, that is completely legit. But I believe that if you want to get into the C-suite, you have to prioritize, as you say, Jen, being present. Um, much of the work that we do is not book learned, but mm -hmm. it is learned through the apprenticeship of working with other people, experience, time. Just this week, I, I meandered down the, the aisle and I sat down with some people and we resolved in 10 minutes, something that would have taken us 10 days on email. Yes. We just you know, hashed it out. My office is next door to our CEO's office. And I watch all day long what's going on, who's coming in, who's going out. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a price you pay because it's an investment in yourself. Sure. And it's, as you say, provocative or even unpopular mm -hmm. to say these things right now where work from home and flex time is a big issue. And it's not that I'm against it, mm -hmm. but I think people should be um, cognizant. pragmatic and cognizant mm -hmm. and aware that there are trade-offs to it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with both of you. I think that if you want to be remote for whatever period of time, at whatever period in your life, it's easier to be remote as an individual contributor, yes. as a spectacular science writer or speech yeah. writer or someone who's pitching the media and, and sitting alone doing that versus being a leader of people, a runner of a function, the kinds of things that do require physical presence to be able to coach people on the spot, on the fly, not by appointment because you booked a call at four o'clock on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have to allow for you know, people's life changes and priorities to shift. Mm -hmm. And you know, that obviously that, that quest yeah. to reach the C-suite you know, may not be 20 years of working from home. Mm -hmm. There may be a period with young children and then things may bounce back to. But it's a difficult moment to manage, right? So people come yes. into the workforce with their expectations I, as a mother, also should be expected to hear and understand those expectations. Yet I have a suite of executives that are there every day um, who don't themselves take flex time. So it's kind of complicated. So you want to be offering that um, flexibility and that option. But the truth is, is that the work is in office. So it's not a perfect fix yet. I think probably over time we'll get better at this and it'll be a little bit more seamless, but I definitely see a clash between expectations and then the work that needs to be done. So I had a rather rapid ascent to a chief title in a company of 120,000 people and I made that choice that there was no flex time. Uh, yes, I had a German contract with great vacation and great time off, but if the priority is for that time in your life, if the priority is your career, you can also make the choice to give up that flexibility and be visible and, and increase your trajectory. And, and that, you know, like everything we have, it's a choice. And now I prioritize my life and my family more than, than my career. And I'm not gonna give up my weekends and my evenings and my vacation. But, but it is, if, if that's your priority to get to the C-suite, you can make a choice, okay, that's more important to me right now than the flex time. And I think that that's helpful for women to know if, if they're making decisions about their career. Mm -hmm. So one, one of the questions, um, if, if we're talking about making choices, 
is uh, how to make a name for yourself. How do you become known for something? What is your brand? You know, I come across this a lot when you speak to someone and they're, they're, you can see in their mind they're trying to put you in a box. What box are you in? Are you in communications? Are you in healthcare? When someone introduces you, oh, that person is this. And, and so the question is a little bit of, do you advise leaning into that early in your career or at what point of your career, leaning into that and, and establishing that name for yourself? Or do you advise um, looking to broaden your experience or what you're probably going to say is do both. We, you know, get as much experience in as many fields, but lean into being an expert in something. Uh, but but what, have, what have you done and would you do it again and what advice do you have for women who are deciding do I stay and stay in this one path and become the expert in this space or do I try to broaden and diversify? I was a specialist for so long and I think in my, from my point of view, I think starting out in your career in order to make a name for yourself, it is important to be that person in that field and I was that person in alcohol <laughs> and then it's not a bad field. <laughs> So to speak, right, right, all under the legal confines. Um, but then I think as you grow, I think you are expected to push yourself out of your comfort zone and do things that aren't really things that you've done before. And I think as I've been able to grow, and I'm still growing, every day I'm, I feel proud that I learn new skills. I'm, I'm like tackling new hurdles that I never even thought were possible because I think I was so comfortable in what I knew I did pretty well and then after that point once that the two years ago I, I started day one they said that's well and good but you know it's, it's not of any value then you know you're in uncharted waters so um, one of my um, mentors is um, the global CMO of another tequila brand and he said it you know as you continue to progress there's something to be said for learning as many skills as you can so who knows you can be a CEO at some point if you want to be if you can learn various parts of a business and so I think you know now being fully integrated into sales and the only woman in the sales department um, I think is you know the next step and who knows after that I may take more executive classes and so it just I think at some point it just opens opens the horizon if you are at that level. To you know, I think a wide experience is never a bad thing, although it's dangerous to, you know, spend 20 years getting such broad experience that you become what it's sort of a jack of all trades and a master of none. But I don't think it's as simple as the way we might think about it growing up in the agency world where it's like I'm a media expert or I'm a digital expert or I'm, you know, the IR expert necessarily. There's a skill-based expertise that we can use to define ourselves. But when I think about some of the people who have been most valuable to me in corporate and in agency settings, they are usually the people, when I'm thinking about them and talking about them, where I'll say or someone else in the room will say, she's so creative, we have to have her at the table. Or this is a really difficult client, she's an amazing client person. You know, she just has a way of being able to break through and get to the heart of the problem. So I think there are other things to be known for that that may be softer in some respects, but, but that might be more reputational. You know, one of my star employees at my, at my last place had said to me, you know, I've been the media person all this time. I know I'm good at media, but I think what I'm really good at is solving problems. And I wish I could just be one of those people who's on that SWAT team whenever there's some huge issue. Not because I'm the media person, which she's amazing at, but because I'm a good problem solver. And I think it's, I think we have to make it okay to aspire to those kinds of things reputationally too. Mm -hmm. Just like having the skill-based reputation, you know, it's equally valid. It's like any, any one of us who's ever had to kind of excavate a brand for a client or within our own company, whether it's a corporate brand or a, uh, you know, a consumer brand, mm -hmm. there are many dimensions to a brand. So I love, I love what Kim's saying and I, I do actually, thinking about this question ahead of time, I was like, well, this is my personal brand, I don't know. I think that there, but I, I think I do know and I think that it, that is, the stuff you know and that you're good at, and then the stuff that you're, um, almost like the behaviors that you're known for. The knowledge and the behaviors is two sides of yeah. one coin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, yeah, and how you work, that's right. And I'm not entirely certain earlier in my career, because I, I was sort of the you, Taylor, of beauty. Mm -hmm. I, for the first two thirds of my career, I was a beauty specialist, in-house and, and agency. And I got known as a beauty. She was a beauty girl. That's a whole other conversation. That it was beauty girl, but and he, right? Am I right? Right? You probably still get called beauty girl. Yeah. Um, but there I, are worse things. Yeah. There were worse things. Actually, you're right about that. It's like you know, she's that hideous girl. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that 
Um, at what point in your career have you been at it long enough to understand the behaviors that you're known for? So I, I think I probably, if I were counseling a younger colleague, I would say maybe focus on the skill set first mm -hmm. as you get to know yourself and as you, and as you continue to grow up in a, in a professional environment. Um, and I think for me there was a moment when I realized I'm good in a room. Mm -hmm. I became the one who was good in a room and whether that was a tough client or whether that was a brainstorm. And so then I was able to turn that into something more than just an expression, oh, she's good in a room. And so, you know, I, I actually love that part of, of what I'm known for because I actually like to be in a room talking, listening, interpreting, um, helping to steer a difficult client conversation back onto the rails, you know. Right. The only other thing I would say too, back to the skill set, I actually wish I had diversified sooner if I'm completely honest. Because when I did then stop doing beauty and started doing just sort of broad-based consumer work, I had a lot of catching up to do. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of sectors that I had to learn very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a balance. That's your book. I'm good in a room. I'm good in a room. <laughs> that's, a that's a great thing right? to be known for. I bet that everyone around this table is good in a room, clearly. Well, we're, we're winding <laughs> down, um, but we haven't talked about money. We haven't talked about negotiation. We haven't talked about how do we, how do we teach the skill of this is what I want. How do we teach women to be able to say that? I think it does go back to our earlier conversation about facts and accomplishments. Mm -hmm. I think that as we all know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of factors that influence the, the um, environment into which a young woman would kind of state her expectations about salary increases or you know, variable comp or whatever it is, depending on how the company's doing that quarter or that year. Candidly, I find it, um, just amongst us and everyone else who sees this, I find it frustrating sometimes that a, a young employee will come forward with a very compelling case for why she needs, why she's worthy of X, Y, and Z from a compensation standpoint, and it's not possible because of larger constraints at the company, whatever company. Even so, I think that there are ways that we can also, you know, as managers and leaders, find other ways to make that employee feel valued mm -hmm. if her salary demands or salary request can't be accommodated. I don't know, I'd actually love the other panelists to talk about it. Is, is talking about money still taboo? No, I, I, the don't, way it was? I don't think talking about money is taboo. My advice is to make sure you're not shooting the ants while the elephants are walking right by you. And how are you defining wealth? Mm -hmm. And how do you accumulate wealth? And it, it reminds me, when, when I worked at Estee Lauder and I was leading the public relations team there, I remember this one person was just wanting this salary increase, just pushing for this salary increase. As, as you're saying, Stephanie, it was a salary increase that could not be achieved mm -hmm. given this is a company, these are levels, there's a larger environment you're in but I am going to provide you with these stock options. I don't want the stock options, I want the salary increase. And I'm, and I'm explaining to this person, these stock options could be worth so, so much, much more. Yes. And ultimately, they were. And you know, the Estee Lauder stock has been one of the great success stories of the industry. And this person still calls me and thanks me. <laughs> Not giving her that you know extra ten thousand dollars salary that she felt so compelled about, but you know educating her and providing this other opportunity for growth. So, of course, it's a difficult subject, and it does have taboo elements. But I think it's really important to educate ourselves about you know what are the various options for deferred savings for for employer contributions. And, and I feel that people falsely rivet on this one number, mm -hmm. which is only one number in a larger so equation. Absolutely. When there's such an attachment to that number, as, as Sally's saying, it's very often a milestone number. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, of course. We've all had and those milestone numbers. It. We understand. Yep. And then also sometimes I can hear that, um, I can hear the coaching. In, in the young person's mm -hmm. voice, and that's fine. It's great that you have someone in your life who's coaching you and giving you advice on this. But, but that, I think, sometimes contributes to the rigidity and, and the, the unwillingness to think about these other kinds of compensation. And it makes them difficult to go home to their fathers and mm -hmm. say, I, I didn't it. get it, Dad. I, I just, it. they said, no, no right. it's really hard. Yeah.
So I want to I want to ask one more question that came up when we were talking earlier. Sally, you're on the board of the IRC. Um, Joanna, you've started your own charity in Uganda. Um, I suspect that many of you have leadership roles outside of your jobs. Uh, how has that contributed to your career? And and do you advise that to? individuals who want to accelerate their career growth or be very successful in their career to also cultivate those volunteer uh, and, and philanthropic and nonprofit uh, growth opportunities together outside of their work. Yeah. It, it reminds me of your earlier question about expertise versus being broad yes. and mm -hmm. I was sitting here thinking well we have to be both deep and broad yes. at the same time Absolutely. and I feel that having been engaged in uh, charity work in politics really helped me to develop my skills, to broaden my network. I was on the board of my college and I ended up chairing the search for the president of the college and I learned a lot. It was a long-term goal of mine to be on the board of a public company, which I am, but I got ready for that by being on boards of charities and, and smaller organizations, not to mention the pure joy of doing good. I don't think there's any disputing that. There's no I'll, disputing no, that. But I'll, but I'll give you a contrarian point of view. Um, we about, knew that you would, Kim. <laughs> well, just, just trying to contribute here. Just, you know, about 10 years ago, I had a summer off. And I'd never had that in my whole adult life. And one of the things I did during that summer was I took tennis lessons. And I'd never played tennis, ever. It wasn't as though I had played in high school and, you know, had dropped off and wanted to learn again. And what I discovered then, and I've tried not to forget it, is that maintaining a beginner's mindset mm -hmm. is really, yes. really important. And it was, it was hard for me to not know how to do it, whatever it was, to really be taking direction and to not be the best and to not be in a leadership position or to struggle to get something right that seemed to come so easily to other people. And ever since then, I have tried to make sure that there are some things in my life that I do that I'm actually not great at. And I find that it's, it's kind of humbling and it's just made me think about how I teach things to people that might be entirely new to them uh, because I'm a student myself mm -hmm. in other ways. So I feel like you know, I've had a lot of leadership opportunity between nine and five. And what I haven't had as much of between nine and five sometimes is maybe you know, being a student and being a beginner again. And I've tried to work that into and my personal life. And not being great at something. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's such an interesting point. Just in summary, I would love if you guys would just kind of go around the room and is there one thought that you have that maybe came out of this round table or just something maybe that we didn't bring up that we should have brought up that you feel is important for tonight's summary? Joanna, will you start? I think ultimately, <clears throat> you know, how do you make the most of your life is what we really touched on through this conversation. So it's not just career and it's not just home or your charitable endeavors, it's everything together. And I think what comes to me when I'm with incredible women such as these and we're having such large conversations such as the one we're having is how to craft and design a life that works for you using all the levers and opportunities that are at your disposal. And truly, I think when I'm in my most successful moment, you feel open and ready and that those doors are open for you. And when you're the opposite is when you're, you know, by yourself, not growing, not learning. So um, it just reminds me to be in that open, confident space and always to be pushing and working with other women who will help you get there. That's very well said. I agree with every bit of that. You know, I'm struck by um, the importance of how women treat other women and women advocating. And I liked your point about being an accomplice. I think that's really important. You know, we haven't talked actually about whether or not other women are sometimes a help or a hindrance. Yes. That's probably the topic of a whole other round table. You know, we've been talking about our relationships with men. Yeah, that's a, that's a big piece. But I think in terms of the, uh, you know, another takeaway is just that there are so many people to admire, men and women, and so many good people to be mentored by, but at the end of the day, you cannot model yourself to sort of be the copycat of someone else. You've got to authentically be who you are and, and be brave enough to acknowledge what's important to you and you know, to always try to sort of polish and, and be the best version of yourself, but that the more we bring our true selves to work, 
as women, as leaders, as, as whatever it else it is that you define yourself by, you know, the better off we'll all be. Hashtag cosign for both of what you guys said. Um, I, I think that there is, I'm actually struck in this room around this table, and there's, there's some other folks in, in the room here at the event, the degrees of separation are pretty short. Um, you know, I think that the, the power of the networks that you build as a woman in business um, can't be underestimated. And I'm struck, I, I was a colleague of Kim's. I was in a room where Sally was my client. I've known you for 5,000 years. Uh, there's another person in this room who interviewed me when I was 12 years old. But I just think there's such power in the relationships that you build and uh, let's call it the old girls network. And I think that, um, not to make that like a, a ghetto or something, but um, there's great power in it and I'm very inspired by it. And the other thing I, we didn't really get to touch on, but uh, I would uh, leave this as a piece of advice to anybody is, yes, find your mentors. Absolutely find your mentors. Um, find your sponsor. And when I look at the two big inflection points in my career that really were like pivotal forks in the road, it's because I had a sponsor who actually actively pushed me and advocated for me to go to the next level of my career and advocated about me in rooms where I wasn't even present. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the distinction of sponsor and mentor is really important to remember mm -hmm. and, and um, I owe it to the two sponsors in my 27 years who got me here. There's a practical point I want to make on the compensation discussion, which is when you're moving a job is the time yeah. where I think That's you can have the most impact mm -hmm. on, on salary. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I think there is still a taboo around people sharing information about what they earn. And I actually really try and help my network of professional friends to say, this is what I make, or this is what that position on my team pays because having that market data is the, mo the easiest way to have confidence to ask for what you want. And if you don't know what it is, it's, it's impossible to make that ask. So I think that there's a practical nature, that, uh, practical advice that we can do, and, and then that's share information where we feel comfortable with each other so that people feel more empowered. My takeaway from, from this and from thinking about my career is nobody has it all figured out. I think professional women put a ton of pressure on themselves to behave a certain way to advance in a certain direction and it's messy it's not linear uh, we all need help and, and that's just the truth of how it will work and it's why we're here to help each other and continue our relationships Sally well first uh, Maureen I want to thank you and everyone at Lippy Taylor for putting together this incredible evening Pleasure. my takeaway from tonight is really how important it is to make time for people and we, we talk about networking and sponsoring and, and all of that I, I think everyone at this table does. But I would encourage us to even go more deeply into uh, forming real relationships and friendships, taking time, whether it's talking to your interns or you know everybody around this table probably worked a long day and then thought to themselves, oh, I've got to go down to Tribeca, you know, and, and, and how am I going to get there? And it's late, and I've got to get home. But, but it's been infinitely worth every minute because, um, you know, I've made some new friends. I've seen some old friends. And it really fuels me, and I think it fuels all of us, to, to have fun doing it, to enjoy one another's company. We spend an awful lot of time at these jobs. And the, the friendships that I've made, in 30 plus years across three companies um, are incredibly precious to me. Absolutely, that's great. Absolutely, I echo everything that you, all of you said. And it's just so inspiring to be with all of the women in the room and the men. Um, and I think mine is just simple. It's just the more that these conversations happen, the more progress that we make. And that's it. And I'm, I'm blessed to be and very grateful to be in this room. And this is one conversation. but. The more of these that you can do and all of us can have, whether they're in intimate settings or in, in larger settings, I think is just going to continue to put us on the trajectory that we all as women should be on. So. Well, that's great. This has been a beautiful evening. I think there have been so many great insights that have been shared, and I thank each and every one of you so much for, for, for everything that you gave to this evening. So thank you. And thank you. Let's, let's party.